record high inflation, soaring crime rates, and war in Europe. Americans are weighing in on President Biden's performance. The latest polls show his approval rating at the lowest point of his presidency. In one effort to stop the skid, the president unveiled his 2023 budget plan Monday. It highlights increased funding for the military and law enforcement while promising to cut inflation. CBN's Jenna Browder reports from Washington. The president's $5.8 trillion proposal looks to address some of the more pressing issues on voters' minds, especially in a midterm year in areas where Democrats could be on shaky ground. The budget stresses defense and safety. With Russia's war in Ukraine still ongoing, the president wants Congress to fund more than $813 billion for national security, up more than $31 billion over last year, including more than $680 million for Ukraine's defense efforts and bolstering cybersecurity and defense systems in the U.S. This budget provides the resources we need to keep Americans safe, ensuring that our military remains the best prepared, best trained, best equipped military in the world. Here at home, the president is looking to distance himself from defund the police calls, proposing $20 billion for the Department of Justice to use on crime prevention programs and federal law enforcement, and $30 billion for new law enforcement, crime prevention and community violence intervention over the next decade. The answer is not to defund our police departments. It's to fund our police and give them all the tools they need, training and foundation and partners and protectors in our, that our communities need. The president is also proposing a so-called billionaire's tax, a 20 percent minimum tax rate for the wealthiest Americans to reduce the deficit. He says it will help cut inflation. If this new tax even passes, and that's really highly questionable, it's very unlikely, almost certain, it will not bring in the amount of money that the Biden people say it will. So the, national, the annual deficits are going to remain high, and the national debt's going to keep going up. We're at $30 trillion now, and we're headed to $40 trillion. All this as new polling from NBC News shows the president's lowest approval rating yet. Only 40 percent approve of his job performance. A staggering 66 percent disapprove of his handling of the economy. And the economy isn't the president's only problem area. Seven out of ten Americans say they have low confidence in his ability to handle the Russia-Ukraine crisis. In his recent trip to Europe, the president's staff had to walk back several verbal gaffes suggesting to U.S. troops they were going to Ukraine, saying the U.S. would respond in kind to chemical attacks by Russia. And this ad lib about Russian President Vladimir Putin. For God's sake, this man cannot remain in power. Yesterday, the president refused to take it back. I'm not walking anything back. The fact of the matter is I was expressing the more outrage, and I make no apologies for it. As to whether the president's budget proposal can help right the ship, analysts point out the president merely makes suggestions. It's up to Congress to write the budget. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Well, CBN chief political anal analyst David Brody is with us now. So, David, let's just start with the poll numbers. Is this budget going to budge them at all? I don't think so, Gordon. I think that train has left the station. There's a narrative out there about Joe Biden, and it's not a good one, unfortunately, uh, for the president. Uh, look, but if you look at the, inside those numbers, I mean, he's down everywhere. I mean, he's not just down with independents from 36 percent to 32 percent. He's down with blacks, Hispanics, women. I mean, it, it runs the gamut. And so that's where you get to that 40 percent approval number, which is so uh, abysmally low uh, because he's not just losing Republicans. He lost them a long time ago. He's lost independence, and now he's starting to lose his own base. And I think that's part of the problem, and I think that's what we saw a bit in this budget, right? I mean, this idea of funding the police, uh, increasing the military uh, spending, you put it all together, he's trying to kind of recoup some of those independents, uh, and, and that's kind of where he's going with this. Uh, but once again, a lot of damage has already been done. You kind of you, you kind of made your, your bed, if you will, with the progressives uh, in the party and try to be this next FDR in the first year of your term. It did not work well. You spent a lot of money. What is it, six, seven trillion dollars? I've lost count with the American Rescue Plan and, and other, uh, you know, other, other bills that were passed. And so you put it all together and now you're trying to put the genie back in the bottle. Very, very difficult. Well, it, w let's talk about the Democrat base and, and the progressives in particular. Uh, the call to defund the police, the, the call for um, all these, it, it just, it, from my point of view, it just boggles the mind. Why would you ever want to defund your police department? But 
Uh, he's trying to get on the other side of that. Is, is he eroding his own base going into the midterms? Well, it's a great question, Gordon. I think that the, the, the calculation inside the White House is this. Uh, do you get... Uh, in terms of the midterm elections, which, by the way, we expect a red wave and, and it might be just too late anyhow. But if you're going to have some sort of shot to salvage something in midterm elections, do you get the progressives on board or do you get the independents on board? And I think clearly, uh, you know, look, follow the money and, and the money in the budget suggests that it's really going to be more about trying to get those independents back uh, rather than the progressives. Now, having said that, Gordon, let's also remember, uh, beyond this idea that he wants to fund the police and that's not going over well with the progressives, he is trying to help the progressives. He's trying to kind of give them a, a few caveats here. And one of them is uh, climate funding. I mean, he, he's uh, increased climate funding in this budget over last year by $16 billion. And he wants to give $1.6 of that to the United Nations Green New Deal Fund, whatever you, they want to call it over there at the United Nations. But $1.6 million of American taxpayer money would go to the United Nations as part of this. So, uh, look, it's not like it's all uh, wonderful for independents. He, he has some progressive nods and winks in the buzz, budget as well. Well, let's talk about the just sheer size of this budget. I mean, you know, there are a lot of individual items that you can point to, but at the same time, it adds up to $5.6 trillion. And uh, I, and he's calling it that somehow or other this is going to fight inflation. Do, do they really not understand the more government prints money, which is what is happening here, the more you expand the money supply, which is going to be needed. Uh, you can say it's paid for all you want, but all you're doing is borrowing from future generations of Americans. So uh, mm -hmm. do they not get that this is inflationary? Well, it's, it's a great question and honestly not even rhetorical. I, I mean, you have to really wonder, do, do they not get it? You know, Larry Summers, the former Obama senior economic advisor, uh, you would think would be supportive of Biden policies. He's not. He said that American Rescue Plan uh, that was supposed to provide COVID relief, it only provided 5 to 10 percent of the money was COVID relief, uh, said it was a way, way much of a, of a bridge too far. And so, uh, look, you're talking five, six trillion dollars, uh, maybe even more, depending on real money. Uh, and then you have to ask that question. So, so I think there is clearly a problem. Also, there's a smoke and mirrors aspect to all of this. You know, this this idea that uh, you know that it's going to balance the budget. I mean, in what fantasy world is that happening in exactly? But this is what Congress does. It's not just you know Biden and his administration. Republicans will do it as well. They'll they'll somehow do fuzzy math and and try to do all of this to to come up with a figure. Uh, so no, no, clearly it's a problem, Gordon. And uh, look, here's the other problem with this budget. Uh, they are making these calculations and assumptions based on the fact that inflation will return to normal levels. Yeah, well, I, th so apparently the budget is not just a policy document, but it's a comedy material as well, because I don't think anybody thinks inflation is going to return to normal levels anytime in the next six months or so. Well, let's talk about something that uh, is, is even more serious than the current inflationary environment. His statements on that European tour if, if I'm in charge of Russian military forces, uh, I absolutely get the message uh, that there, there's not going to be any peace agreement we can come to. What, what are they trying to do in terms of walking it back? And then in turn, he comes around and says, I'm not walking anything back. Uh, is, is this going to eventually get us into a war in Europe? Well, that, that's the concern, and I think it's, it's, a real, it's a real concern. You know, like, the last thing we need right now is hyperbole and dramatic statements. Uh, but look, this is straight-up analysis, yes. I mean, the, the, this is the type of rhetoric, uh, call it a bungle, a gaffe, call it uh, serious or not, they can land us right into a World War III. And look, I mean, what Biden did there is gave Putin a talking point. You know, forget about what Germany and NATO and others think at this point. It's what, what does Putin think? I mean, Putin's going to pipe that into Soviet uh, media, if you will, and say, you see, I told you so. Uh, the, the president of the United States is, is, in essence, for a coup against me and our government. I mean, that, that's what he's going to say. And so... Uh, here's the problem for the Biden administration. Was it a walk back or not? At first, there, it was the sense that there was it was a walk back. They were trying to walk it back. And then Biden, as we just saw in Jenna's piece, so he's not walking anything back. So there are so many mixed messages here. And this is the last uh, last thing anyone needs is any mixed messages here. Clarity is key. And we're not getting much of it. All right. Well, David, thanks for the insight. And uh, for anyone watching, please. Pray for our president. Pr please pray for our leadership.
I know it's sometimes difficult to pray for those who are in power, but he needs unusual wisdom. These are very difficult times we're all facing. Uh, and you may not agree with his policies. I certainly don't. Uh, but that still doesn't mean I don't have a requirement as a Christian to pray for those in leadership. Well, let's turn to other news, more fallout from the Oscars, the, the whole alopecia um, with, with Jada Pinkett Smith. I just want to say my, my mother has lived with that disease for a quarter of a century. And I understand what it does. And I understand what it does to your willingness to even go out in public and, and be seen. Um, and I just applaud her for the dignity to say, I'm going to go to the Oscar ceremony. I'm going to have my disease broadcast around the world. Uh, the problem with it is there's no cure. Uh, there's, there's no... Um, uh, medical science doesn't even know the, the, the source and why it happens. So uh, I, I applaud her for her dignity in just saying, I'm going to show up and I'm going to learn to live with this disease. That's what my mother has done now for a quarter of a century. I know the cost it takes and I applaud her for it. For more on the story, we go to Ephraim Graham with the CBN Newsroom. Ephraim? Gordon, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences says it is considering further actions and consequences against actor Will Smith. Meanwhile, Smith issued a public apology to comedian Chris Rock Monday. Smith slapped Rock across the face during Sunday's live Oscar broadcast after a joke about his wife, Jada Pinkett Smith. In his Instagram apology, Will Smith said he was out of line and wrong and that he reacted emotionally to the joke about his wife's shaved head, which is due to a condition, a medical condition, called alopecia. Later in the ceremony, Will Smith won his first Academy Award for Best Actor in King Richard. In his acceptance speech, he revealed a piece of spiritual advice Denzel Washington gave him. Denzel said to me a few minutes ago, he said, at your highest moment, be careful, that's when the devil comes for you. Academy officials reportedly considered removing Smith from the theater after the incident. It is unclear if Chris Rock knew about Jada Pinkett Smith's medical condition. Turning now to the war in Eastern Europe, Ukrainian and Russian officials met for peace talks for the first time in weeks, beginning today in Istanbul, Turkey. Ukraine's president said his country is prepared to declare its neutrality and not to join NATO and is open to compromise over the contested Donbass region in the east. The talks come as Russian forces are still bombarding cities and villages in Ukraine, leaving buildings and streets in ruins. Ukrainian forces are claiming new victories, including the city of Irpin, just north of Kyiv. Millions of Ukrainians are displaced from their homes and suffering shortages of food and water. CBN's Operation Blessing is helping meet their needs by sending fresh produce across the border from its warehouse in Poland. We are here at our Operation Blessing warehouse in Poland, not far from the Ukrainian border, from where we receive lots of shipments of produce that go straight into Ukraine. And behind me you see a truck being loaded with fresh produce, like these oranges and apples and mandarins, and wonderful nutritious food that will really help the people in Ukraine right now because there's such a shortage and such a demand. And these items will go across the border straight away, so in a few hours, they will be offloaded onto vans that will go straight into the, the communities in Ukraine where people will be uh, using those very fresh produce to feed their families and feed their children. And it's all possible because of your support. So thank you very much for your generous giving. There you see Operation Blessing in perfect position to offer assistance. Gordon? It's wonderful to be a, a help to those in need, and it's wonderful to have so many people supporting the effort. Thank you. If you're part of the Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Fund, thank you. On behalf of all the refugees, all the Orphans Promise Centers in Ukraine, the surrounding countries, uh, thank you. You're, you're doing your part. If, if you want to be a part of it, all you have to do is pick up the phone and call us, 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I want to give to the Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Fund. You can also write to us at CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia. Just put Disaster Relief Fund in the memo line of a check. 
You can text us, OB Crisis, to 71777, or you can just go online at CBN.com. There's a place where you can designate your gift to the Disaster Relief Fund. Do it now. Be part of helping those in need. As a candidate for the U.S. Senate from Pennsylvania, Kathy Barnett knows the value of separating herself from the pack. Her life story, however, is a much more than a campaign narrative. Conceived in rape, raised in poverty, she's a testimony that God has a plan for every life. A message she's dedicated to spreading on the campaign trail. CBN's David Brody introduces us to this unique candidate. When voters in Pennsylvania meet Kathy Barnett, they see smiles and hear a straightforward message. Everything is on fire. Our nation is in a nosedive. Behind the rhetoric is a deeper story. I grew up in a home with no insulation, no running water, an outhouse in the back and a well on the side. While a childhood of poverty is tough enough, Barnett's entry into the world could be considered a miracle. I am the byproduct of a rape. My mother was 11 years old when I was conceived. My father was 21. And I am so grateful to God that there were adults in the room. I'm so grateful to God that there were, you know, people who came alongside my very young mother when she was in a very broken place. And there I was <laughs> in her womb. I had, I took no part in how I was conceived. And yet there I was, they saw me as someone with value. <laughs> I'm so grateful, how simple. And yet today we have murdered over 63 million babies because somehow we have convinced ourselves that that life has no value, that that life has no purpose. My life is valuable. My life has purpose. Barnett didn't find out about this part of her life until joining the military in her late teens. Looking at her birth certificate for the first time, she did the math, asked questions, and reached out to her mom, and then made peace. Well, all of that was blocked out until my daughter brought it to my attention. I, I never talked about it. I never wanted them to think about it. I thought I kept it hid from them, but mm. I should have realized they had their birth certificate. After the reconciliation came another meeting that would change her life. Barnett found Jesus after a dream about the book of Revelation. She heard an audible voice saying, go back home, and recalls telling God something specific on the way. I mean, if you are real, and if you can really save my life, and I won't be a hypocrite like some that I've seen growing up as a child, then I want you. And I believe it was during that time from on that train ride from California to Alabama that I gave my life to the Lord. It all started to make sense for her. And I can see how at the age of 19, how he grabbed my hand and he began to show me my purpose and how everything about me is by design. You know, the Word of God says that it is Him who, who decides the day and the, the time and the place where we will be born. Barnett became the first in her family to finish college, saw success in the corporate world, and is now running for United States Senator. I know what matters most to you and your family because I am you. As a homeschooling mom of two, She's tired of the indoctrination. Oh, we have critical race theory that goes into classroom and teaches little white kids that because of the color of your skin, you're evil, right? It is racist and it is wrong. If she wins, Kathy Barnett would become the U.S. Senate's first black Republican woman. She makes a habit of calling out Democrats for using black voters to their advantage. What exactly have we gotten for our loyalty? Right? We know what Democrats get. They cannot secure the White House without getting 92 to 95 percent of the black vote. So they get the White House. But what exactly have we gotten? The May primary is hotly contested in a state that could determine which party controls the Senate. It's a crowded GOP field. David McCormick has many high profile endorsements and he leads the field. Former talk show host Dr. Oz is in the race and has name recognition. While Barnett polls in the single digits, she's gaining a strong grassroots following. She points out that neither opponent is from Pennsylvania. 
Barnett, who's lived there for almost a decade, wants to make sure voters get that message. These carpetbaggers <laughs> have been spending buku's millions. Within the first two weeks of February, Oz had already spent $7 million. Just the first two weeks. Who does that? She pitches herself as a citizen legislator such as the founders intended. Our nation is in need of good people to get engaged. Our nation is in need of those who will take a long-term custodial view of our country. Our country does not have long-term custodians. How do you define success? What are you trying to accomplish as you, as you win here? Because God can, God's a God of miracles. He can take you all the way to the U.S. Senate and he can do something else with your life. I want to um, finish this race and hear the Lord say, well done. <laughs> My good and faithful servant, you ran your race that was in front of you. God bless America! She wants an America that gives others the opportunities that she got. Her supporters are praying for her to do just that here in Pennsylvania. We give you glory and honor and praise and we thank you once again for Kathy and this commitment that she's made. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. David Brody, CBN News, in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. Well, that's not a story you're going to see in many news outlets, but that is a life that preaches. That is a life well lived. If you want to find that same life, the same thing that Kathy found, pray that same prayer. Jesus, if you're real if you really can be my savior, if you can enable me to live a life for you. I don't want to be a hypocrite. I want to live for you. Can you do that for me? What a wonderful prayer. What a wonderful life. What a wonderful answer to prayer. Uh, if you need help with this prayer, all you got to do is call us. 1-800-700-7000. Ashley. The little girl was just two and a half years old. She had HIV, cholera, and tuberculosis. Her mother had already died of AIDS, and doctors said she wasn't going to make it either. To many, this child was a hopeless case. But to Lisa Harper, she was the answer to 30 years of prayers. Lisa Harper is an author and speaker who has served in ministry for over 30 years. While her resume is impressive, Lisa will tell you that her greatest achievements are serving God and becoming the mother of Missy, who she adopted from Haiti. In her new podcast, Back Porch Theology, Lisa uses humor and a down-to-earth approach to tackle some of life's most important issues. All right, well, joining us now via Skype is the amazing Lisa Harper. Lisa, thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, I'm so tickled to get to see you again. Your face makes me happy. Oh my gosh, your face makes me happy. You, you just, your <laughs> smile brightens up my day. All right, well, first, let's talk about your new podcast. The name of the podcast is Back Porch Theology. Why not Front Porch Theology, The Living Room <laughs> Theology, The Coffee Shop Theology? Uh, tell us more about the name. Great question. Um, yeah, I live in the American South and the front porch, a lot of people have front porches and front porches are great. You get to wave to your neighbors and you have sweet tea on the front porch, but everybody can see it. So they tend to be kind of Pinterest perfect, but the back porch, that's where you actually, you know, you can be a little louder, a little messier. The conversations are a little longer. And I wanted to, as best we could, demystify the idea that theology is this boring, dusty, esoteric subject matter. And I thought, what better way to do it than to explain this is in a totally safe environment where you can lean back in a proverbial back porch and really be honest about, about God and about the things that you need to know, the things where you're struggling, walking in your faith. So we have had a blast on the back porch. Yes, I love it. I love it. We'll, we'll, we're going to talk more about that. But before we do, we got to talk about your amazing adoption journey. You started the adoption process uh, when you turned 40 and then stopped. Uh, you actually stopped for seven years. Why was that? Because I was terrified. I, I really struggled with shame for so many years. There's some uh, 
some molestation, some stuff in my backstory that made me feel like I was just dirty and damaged. I came to Christ when I was a little girl, but I didn't think God liked me very much. I, I felt like he had kind of lowered the bar to let me into the kingdom. And so I understood at a very elementary level that I needed him to deliver me from my sin. I, I just didn't think he delighted in me. I couldn't even conceive of of that. So it took years and years for uh, God to pull some of the most toxic roots of shame out of my heart. And then at about 40, when I began praying about the possibility of adoption, I wasn't even sure if that was allowed theologically. You know, as a single woman, I was so broken when I was younger, I didn't get married. I still tease and say my husband is lost, won't stop to ask for directions. But I thought, goodness, I don't even know if that's like allowed. You know, I literally went to seminary professors and I said, is this Okay, we talked about the fall. We talked about the fact that, of course, it's best for a child to have a mom and a dad who loves them, but there's 147 million, give or take a million or two, orphans in the world as we know it today, many of whom will die, um, not having pretty simple things like access to clean water. And I thought a lot of those kids are dying before they even make it through infancy. So maybe in those cases, when a kid doesn't have much of a shot at a mom and a dad, mm. maybe a fluffy single woman in Tennessee would be would be better than the alternative. Yeah. And, and at about 40, I was just about to step into the waters, those waters, and a woman from church, from a church small group, told me, she said, I wanna be real honest with you. She said, you know, the Bible says the wounds of a friend are better than the kiss of an enemy. It's crazy how people can use the Bible as a club when it was never God's intended purposes because she used that verse out of context and she said, Lisa, I know you're praying about adoption, but I think you've sabotaged that shot. She said, you've told our small group how you have some molestation, some sexual abuse in your backstory. I know you've been to Christian counseling, but just in case you weren't fixed, you might unwittingly transfer some of that trauma onto a child of your own. So she said, I don't think you should become anybody's mom. I know you want to nurture. So my encouragement would be for you to go to the Nashville Humane Society and adopt a dog because you're really good with pets. And oh I should have known that that woman um, wasn't sharing good fruit, you know, that she had just been through such a serious storm or a drought in her life that that it bent her trunk and she wasn't bearing good fruit because what she was speaking wasn't congruent with God's word. He might say no or wait or have a different plan, but God will never tell us we're not good enough for what he's called us to. He doesn't use shame as a motivational tool. But you know what she said resonated with my greatest fear, kind of the deepest bruise of shame in my heart. So I just put the adoption papers I'd secretly printed out in the back of my file drawer. Next day, I got off work and I drove to the Nashville Humane Society and I adopted a chocolate lab named Sally with bladder control problems. Um, she's a sweet dog. She's a little dribbly, but she's sweet. Yeah. But it was seven more years before I had enough faith um, I, I hate that it took me that long. I wish I was more like Bartimaeus. Remember when the crowd shamed him, it says they rebuked him for crying out to Jesus and he cried out all the more. Um, I, that wasn't my response. I just kind of bent down and thought, yeah, this is my lot in life. I just have to be a good girl and keep my head bowed. What happened in my past must have put a lid on my destiny. Um, but our God is so good. You know, he is the author and the finisher of our faith. And so at 47, um, after I started adoption, lost one at the 11th hour, by the absolute redemptive grace of God, I got written into Missy's story right after her first mama, Marie, passed away. I can't wait to meet Marie in glory and go, can you believe what God has done with our daughter? Um, and it was a two year process. It was a, um, it was, it was not easy. Sometimes international adoption when there's some, some other issues can, uh, it's not for the faint of heart. Mm -hmm. I told somebody the other day, she said, what was your adoption journey like? And I said, it was like hiking up a high mountain in rollerblades wow. in the rain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was, it was slippery. It was tough. But me in the last, I've had her home for seven and a half years now, and it has been just glorious. Yeah. Um, 
it's unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, just looking at those images that popped up on the screen, I mean, she literally is a ray of sunshine. And I had the honor and the privilege of meeting her a few years ago when you were here on the 700 Club. Oh, and both of you. Both of you guys together, it's just, it just makes sense. And both of you guys are just shining the light of Christ. So I just, I'm so grateful for the Lord to, for putting you both together. Lisa, I wish, I wish we had more time. We could just keep talking for hours, but we got to cut it short. New episodes of Back Porch Theology drop every single week. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast provider to catch up on past episodes and listen to new ones as they're released. Lisa, thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I, it is an honor. I'm tickled and delighted. And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. We begin in Florida, where Governor Ron DeSantis signed a bill into law that stirred national debate. It forbids public schools to teach sexual orientation and gender identity to students K through 3. Opponents say it marginalizes gay and transgender people. DeSantis said it guarantees parents their children will get a, quote, education and not an indoctrination. The law gives parents the right to sue, to sue school districts that cross the line. Protesters in Germany are helping the children of Ukraine while honoring the victims of the conflict. They laid teddy bears in front of a cathedral in Cologne, Germany over the weekend honoring the children who've been killed since the war began. People also held signs saying Putin kills children and stop war now. Then after the special event, the toys were given to some of the children who have been forced to flee Ukraine. Want to remind you, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's CBNNews.com. Devin Tucker was trapped. His captors held a gun to his head and they forced him to have sex with strangers. Devin was trafficked across 11 states. He thought there was no way out. And then one day, he knocked on a stranger's door. I got held at gunpoint, and they told me, no, there is no escaping, there is no leaving, there is no, no telling. Devin Tucker spent most of his life trapped in circumstances beyond his control. It started with childhood neglect by his parents that shaped his view of himself and the world. I felt empty, like just like nobody cared. Eventually, it got to the point where I thought, well, maybe this is the norm just for my life. Maybe this is how it's supposed to be. The only time he felt loved was when he was with his grandmother, who brought him to church and taught him to pray. When nobody else was around, I could rely on grandma, and I was expecting her to be there forever. Things got, got dark. Things got, things went south when she passed away. By the time he was in middle school, he'd run away from home and traded arguments with his mom for chaos on the streets of Detroit. In the years that followed, Devin made thousands of dollars selling drugs. Still, he remained trapped in fear. I felt like there was no security. I was always worried, always stressed out about who's after me. Even my best friends, are they after me? You know, it's not just the police, it's the ones that are close to you. His fears became reality when police raided his house. They seized drugs and $200,000 in cash. Devin was facing 15 to 25 years in prison. As he sat in jail waiting for trial, he remembered what his grandmother taught him about prayer. So I prayed in jail and I said, um, God, I don't know if you're real or not, but if you are, if you let me go, I, I'll stop selling drugs, I'll quit. Went to court, had my hearing, and I was free. Devin was released on a technicality and never sold drugs again. Needing income, he joined a company that takes young people state to state selling magazines. He soon found out it was a front for a sex trafficking ring. I was stuck. There, there's no getting out. I was held at gunpoint, and I've watched people get beaten, left almost for dead. Where am I gonna go if I'm being followed in every room? Where am I gonna go if there's a van following me in every neighborhood? Who am I gonna call? I don't have a cell phone. You get desperate for freedom, but then you also give up. It's like, why, why try? Why bother when all angles have been blocked off. 
For the next year and a half, Devin was forced to have sex with strangers. Trafficked through 11 states and desperate for freedom, he spent three days praying for rescue. Then the next day, while selling magazines, he knocked on the door of a family involved with Florida abolitionists, a group dedicated to freeing people from sex slavery. They sensed he was in danger and offered him help. He says, do you want help? The way he looked at me, the way he said it, I had to understand it. You want to help me leave my situation. The family was able to rescue Devin from his captors and gave him new hope. He said something that triggered. He said, for God so loved the world, John 3, 16, that he gave his only begotten son. Then he quoted it different. He said, for God so loved Devin that he gave his only begotten son. And it, it hit me personally in a way. And I thought about the times I've been shot, stabbed, locked up, the times that I went through, like throughout just my whole life from elementary all the way up until, you know, now, like, you did this because you loved me. This was more than, this was not just saving me from hell. You, you, you love me. And that reality is what, yes, Lord. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for, for, for what you, you did for me. That day, Devin was rescued physically and spiritually. When he surrendered his life to Christ, he was finally set free. Everything that I never had, he completely did the opposite and turned it around and gave it to me. Complete restoration. It had to start out with God's grace, and that's what I'm thankful for, just the blessings that come with it. Um, and I mean blessings in the sense of just being able to wake up and feel the freedom. God has given me a family. I just thank God for every, every ounce of it, you know, every, every drop. He shares his story, hoping others who are being trafficked will find help as they cry out to God for freedom. God hears you. Every prayer, every thought, and there is hope. And if he can set me free, then he can help you get free. And he can help you get free. I don't care what you're going through, what you've done, what you've done to other people, what other people have done to you. In God's eyes, you are still his child. You can't ever change that. There's nothing you can do that can ever separate you from the love of Christ. Isn't that a wonderful news? It's the best news that anyone has ever heard. All you have to do to receive it, to receive the free gift that he gives, for God so loved you, you can fill in your name, Devin filled in his name, Gordon filled in his name. You can be a whosoever. For God so loved the world, that's you, that he gave, he gave Jesus, that whosoever, I can be a whosoever, you can be a whosoever, would believe on him, would not perish, but have everlasting life. He loves you so much. He wants you to be with him in eternity. He loves you that much that he was willing to die for you. This saying is worthy of all acceptance. Jesus Christ came to save sinners, of whom I am chief. These are the words of the Apostle Paul. He knows a thing or two about sin. He knows a thing or two about salvation. Here he was persecuting Christians dragging men and women in chains off to jail just because of what they believed. He called himself, I'm an injurious man. I did these things. But Jesus, he came for me. He died for me. And he died for you too. All you have to do is say yes to it. Why would you neglect this great salvation? 
why would you neglect the one who gave his life for you? That loves you so much, he wants to hear your voice, he wants to hear your prayer, he wants to be with you, he wants to be Emmanuel, God with us. You can change that one too. God with me, all around me, in me, overflowing. If you want this, let's pray a very simple prayer, and Jesus will answer what he did for Devin, what he did for me, he will do for you. All you have to do is ask. Let's pray. Jesus, say his name, say it out loud. Jesus, I come to you and I ask that you come for me, that you be my Savior, that you be the one who forgives me of all the things that I've done wrong that you would regenerate me in my innermost being, that you would remake me into your image, your likeness, your spirit, your heart, your mind. And Jesus, if you do this, I want to follow you all the days of my life. Hear my prayer, for I pray it. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, for those who just prayed, I ask for a baptism in your love. I ask that you fill them to overflowing with your love and your acceptance, your deliverance. Set them free, Lord God, for we ask it in your name. Amen. If you prayed with me, I've got something for you. It's called a new day. In here is this packet. There's a CD teaching. If you don't have a CD player, that's okay. We've got a download for you. But I want you to have it. It, it t tells you how do you know you've been forgiven? How do you know you've been set free? What do Christians believe? How do you live the Christian life? There's no financial obligation at all for this. I want you to have it. It's absolutely free. All you have to do is call us. 1-800-700-7000. Ashley. Choosing between pain pills and buying groceries. That's what Christina has to face whenever she has a flare-up of lupus and can't work. Sometimes this single mom has nothing to feed her two boys. That's when Christina says she feels as if she's drowning and taking her children along with her. Christina and her boys have been through a lot of challenges, but their love for one another sustained them. My family is everything to me. They keep me going, they keep me strong. They are the reason why I wake up every day and work and do the best I can. Christina suffers from lupus and has gone through many seasons where she wasn't able to work. There are several times in my life that I have had flares where I have been bedridden. No matter how hard it was, I always moved forward. I always kept on trying to work. It makes it hard to keep a steady job. Choosing between paying bills and groceries, there's times that you don't know what you're gonna do. You don't know how to face your children and when it's dinner time or they're hungry and you really don't have anything and it almost feels like you're drowning and you're taking your children with you. Her church, Open Door in Burleson, Texas, has partnered with Operation Blessing for 30 years. When she found out she could turn to them for help, everything changed. If you had a need and if you were hurting and you were broken, they were there to bless you. And when I leave, I always feel empowered and I feel refreshed and I feel like I'm not alone. The food that you receive, the quality is great. The kids get excited. I get excited because it's like, oh, what do we get to make? What do we get to have? You know, and you don't have to make that choice to pay a bill or to get food. And you feel good as a parent being able to put that on the table for your kids. Now Christina is in the process of starting a home-based business. She says she'll always be grateful for Operation Blessing Partners who gave when she needed it most. Thank you. The food from Operation Blessing has helped me get back on my feet and not just by providing food, but providing a good example for me and my children. When I do have, when you give something, you don't have to think about it, just give it. The partners of Operation Blessing, they have just totally changed my life and my children's lives. 
Wow. Well, if you are a CBN partner, thank you. Thank you for coming alongside of us and partnering with us to change the lives of families like you just saw, not only right here in uh, the U.S., but also internationally. We are providing food, clean water, um, necessary surgery, simple surgeries that a lot of people can't afford in foreign countries. So you're doing that all in the name of Jesus, and you're spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ as you are helping people around the world. So if you're not a CBN partner and you feel encouraged by that story to give, I encourage you to join with CBN today. It's really simple. All you have to do is give us a call at 1-800-700-7000, or you can also go to CBN.com, or you can do my personal favorite, text CBN to 71777. When you do a little giving page like you see on your screen, it's going to pop up, and there you have the different options, the different levels you can join at. You can join at 700 Club, which is $20 a month. You can go up from there, 700 Club Gold. Whatever the Lord is putting on your heart, just be obedient to that. And again, if you want to join with us and you want to change the lives around the world, just give us a call or text us. All right. Well, you got we got time for email. All right. Let's, All right, do it. let's go for it. All right. So this is uh, Sherry. She mm -hmm. says, I wanted to ask you if God will forgive you if you have done some really bad things while being a Christian. I became a Christian when I was a really little girl, but messed things up during my life. Now I am old and I'm afraid I will not go to heaven because of what I have done. Uh, Sherry, absolutely God will forgive you. Absolutely he will restore you. He'll make you new again. Here's a Bible verse for you. You can go read it yourself because it's in your Bible too. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So whatever it is you've done, I mean, you can make a long list. I, I remember when I came back to the Lord, I had to make a I had to spend months. <laughs> and I kept, you know, things kept coming back. And it's like, okay, I got to make another list. You know, and just put it before the Lord and, 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 and say, okay. Uh, then I had my dear father who loves me a great deal came. And he, he said, Gordon, stop this. Um, you, you know, here, ha here's a great prayer. The, the sins you know and remember and the sins that are unknown and unremembered. Get forgiveness for all of it. Christianity is a great salvation, and we get to start over. The story of the prodigal son was, was written for me, and it can be written for you. You can be that prodigal child who comes home. You've gone, you've spent your inheritance on things of the world, and he'll, he'll receive you with open arms. He'll put a turban on your head, which is a symbol of salvation. He'll put a ring on your finger, which means you're part of the family again. You're part of that royal priesthood. Take full advantage of it. It's not an excuse to sin, but it sure is a license to be forgiven. Here's a word from Proverbs. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. God bless you. We'll see you again tomorrow.